you so much for that warm welcome. I really appreciate it. Good morning. Good morning, good Vermont. Um, so as Enid said, I am definitely a um, newbie here to Vermont. I'm a visitor, so my first priority, my mother would always say, is to thank my host. And I'm definitely thankful so much to Nofa, uh, for Nofa Vermont for inviting me here. And I'd also like to give a thanks and a real pay, pay homage to the Abenaki, the original people, the first peoples of this land. Um, that's really important to me, partly because given our conference theme, organic matters, culture and agriculture, I really just can't think of a better way to begin. When I look out at this beautiful landscape with its graceful hills and its dense forests, I'm just so grateful for the countless ways the Abenaki have cared for this land for generations, thousands of years. And I'm, I'm sure they're probably Abenaki here today, given their efforts to preserve agriculture heritage in this region. All of us who visit here and live here benefit from your sacrifices and your teachings. And your practices are the backbone of organic agriculture. So I really thank you. Um, And I thank you all again today to join me here as we contemplate this idea of organic matters. Um, and when I say the word organic, I, what comes to mind? I always like to ask this in different um, communities. Um, do you think of a bucolic field of green stretching out as far as the eye can see? Um, or maybe that uh, beautiful still life of a produce department that is Whole Foods? You know, what do you think about when you think of organic? Uh, when I'm here, I, I'm really I'm here to speak about organic from the botanical sense, meaning of, related to, or obtained from living things. That's a big part of what I'm here to speak about. Um, organic in the sense of, from the perspective of an organism, which I am, which you are, um, in community with other organisms all around us, you name it, moles, millipedes, nematodes, all of it together in community. Um, and to me, that's organic in the way a poet might use the word, or a writer, a biologist, an artist. Not necessarily the way that a chief marketing officer might, right? And that's the way we really hear the word used most commonly these days, right? Organic in the sense of like, no petrochemicals were used in growing this 5,000 micro, you know, monocrop of wheat or something like that. Or organic in the sense of there are a couple of organically grown raisins in this huge box of cookies with, you know, um, corn syrup and all of these other things. Not really the organic that most of you who are growing are thinking about, the way that you mean it. So I'd like to reclaim that word, personally, organic. I'd like to take it back from those corporate marketers, and I don't think they ever really reserved it. But part of that reclamation comes when we remember the roots of organic agriculture and unearth some of what has been forgotten and hidden and obscured in that story. So this morning, I'll share some of the hidden or origins of organic agriculture that stem from my own cultural background. And my hope and my goal is to inspire each of you to do the same. We'll reach back into our agrarian roots together and share our memories, speak our memories, listen to each other's stories. This is really important to me because I truly believe that our collective stories hold both the origins and the future of organic. So when I think back about my own personal origins, my own story, it starts with farmers. I come from farmers, despite this outfit. I do come from farmers. So I was born and raised on the Lower East Side of New York City in Manhattan. Anyone familiar with the Lower East Side? Great. Um, so I was raised by uh, two people who grew up on farms. Their farms were an ocean apart. So my father's father, my paternal grandfather, was a goat farmer, um, as his father was before him on the island of St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands. So, ooh, I see some nods about that too. Okay, some folks have been there. Um, so, my, so my grandfather, my paternal grandfather was a farmer. Um, he also owned and operated a bakery. He owned a bed and breakfast. Um, he owned a catering service. He was also the janitor in the local high school. And best of all, he was a boxing promoter, right? Talk about off-farm jobs. My grandfather had them all. But at core, he was a farmer, as was my mother's uh, father. Um, so my mom grew up in Alabama, 
in the southern United States. And uh, my grandfather farmed corn and soybeans and cotton for over 40 years um, during that time. Over 40 years he grew. And uh, it was amazing to me as a city girl going to visit him in Alabama. We usually would go visit during Christmas time, um, so I didn't see that much of the land in production at the time. Um, but we did spend a couple of times going there in the summer, and it was amazing to see cotton in bloom. Uh, who here? Is anyone here from the South besides my? Oh, OK. We've got some folks in here. Have you ever stood in a field of cotton when the cotton is high? OK. Has somebody here? Right? So like, as far as your eye can see, there's just nothing but these beautiful balls of cotton just blowing in the breeze. It's an amazing, beautiful, surreal sight, especially for the city girl. But for me, what was even more amazing was my grandmother's garden. So my grandmother grew every single thing that her family of five ate in this garden, okay? Every single thing. And that garden was maybe a half an acre, uh, was not a big piece of land at all. Um, but on it grew every single vegetable I'd ever heard of when I was five years old, every vegetable I'd ever heard of, and plums and peaches and figs and muscadine grapes, persimmons, you name it, everything. Cows, hogs, the whole nine. My grandmother stewarded this land and grew until she was over 85 years old. She was still out there farming. That was long enough for me to watch her chickens running loose underneath her fruit trees, just fertilizing everything. It was long enough for me to help her bring in newborn chicks into her bedroom in a cardboard box when it was chilly outside, which I remember so well. It was long enough for me to notice that the tomatoes grew over by the fence this year and all the way out by the shed the next year. But it wasn't really long enough for me to really ask her why she was doing these things. It wasn't long enough for me to dig into the science and the art of her growing techniques and to learn about their cultural significance. It felt like a real loss to me, and it still does today. And I'm wondering, you who come from farmers like me, can anyone relate to that? that sense of loss. Who here actually comes from farmers? Whose parents were farmers in this room? Just want to know. How about grandparents? Okay. Great grandparents? Anyone even know that? Yes. Wonderful. So I'd like you to think about the farming elder in your life. And if you don't have a relative, maybe it's just a person that you know who's an older person that you learned from, a farmer in your life. And if it feels safe for you, I'd like you to take a moment to just Bring them into the room with us today. You can close your eyes if that feels comfortable for you. If not, it's no big deal. Um, but just take a moment to think of that person and, and bring their face, their essence to your mind. Uh, maybe you can see their eyes and maybe their hands that work the soil. Can you just get a sense of them in your gut that they're here with you? Do you recall ever seeing this farmer, this agrarian ancestor of yours working the land? Do you have a loving memory of this farmer, your own or one that was passed down to you? Our stories are the bedrock of who we are and what we know. I'd like you to open your eyes and turn to a neighbor this is where it gets participatory. <laughs> I'd like you to turn to a neighbor. And if it's someone, if you have a neighbor to your left and your right, and uh, maybe you know one person better than the other, turn to the person you don't know as well. I'd like to take a minute, a few minutes, just to share this story, this agrarian ancestral story. And it might just be literally your neighbor next door. Maybe the story is five minutes old. Whatever it is, I'd like to just take a few minutes to share that story, listen to the other person's story, and share your own. And I'll keep time for you. I'll let you know when about a minute or two is up, and you can switch. Um, but let's start now. And maybe the person with the longest hair, first to talk. Okay. <laughs> Starting now. <laughs> Have about 20.
Okay. If you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap twice. If you can hear me, shake your hands over your head. Can you tell I work with kids sometimes? <laughs> um, it's definitely a kid thing. Thank you so much for sharing, really. Um, if we had more time, I would definitely want to hear from you and invite you to stand up and just share out. I think it's so important for us all to hear these stories. Um, we don't have that much time today, so I'm going to hold back from doing that. At the end, I'll mention some way that we can actually maybe share these stories more widely. Um, but sharing and learning from each other's stories can really help us connect to people from vastly different backgrounds. That's why I always love to do that. Did anyone speak with someone that they thought they knew really well and hear something totally different, like they'd never heard of before from this person? Surprising, right? Or someone who spoke with someone that you total stranger, but their story really resonates in some way with what you were doing? Yeah, I see some hands. Yeah, that's the beauty of sharing these stories for me as those surprises and people that we think we know so well. So seeds, uh, stories in general, can help us connect with each other. And um, one type of story that I love to tell and connect with, because I think so many different cultures have them, are seed stories. Um, so there's one story about seeds that I want to share right now. It's not exactly from my background, but I, I relate to it a lot. Um, this story uh, is told in Brazil. It's how, the story of how rice came to Brazil. Now, most people associate rice with Asia, rightfully so. Um, there are about two dozen types of rice in, uh, in our world, and two types of those rices were actually domesticated. One was domesticated in Asia, but the other was domesticated in West Africa, which we don't often think about. But there is such a thing as African rice. And the African rice was introduced to the Americas, uh, including Brazil and Suriname and southern United States, with slavery in the 16th and 17th centuries. Now, Western accounts credit European navigators, colonists, and men of knowledge with the introduction of rice to the Americas. But oral tradition and some contemporary accounts tell a different story. In Brazil, they tell the story of a mother in Africa hundreds and hundreds of years ago, whose daughter was going to be sold into slavery. As one last act of maternal love and care, the mother combed and braided her daughter's hair one last time. As she braided her daughter's hair, she weaved in grains of rice, the rice that was native to their homeland. Now, knowing her daughter would be stripped of her belongings, of her clothes, of her identity, of everything, the mother found one place where her daughter could hold something sacred. She buried the seeds within the girl's hair for safekeeping like precious jewels, and they were precious, right? The seeds were a vital link to her past and the promise of sustenance for her future. So the daughter was taken from the mother. She spent months chained in the dark hull of a slave ship crossing the Atlantic Ocean in the Middle Passage, seeds hidden in her hair. She spent years enslaved on Brazilian plantations. Every day, she'd plant and harvest sugarcane in unimaginable conditions. Every night, she'd loosen her braids, gather her mother's seeds, and slowly braid them back into her hair. There came a day when she was able to liberate herself from slavery. She escaped into the forest of Brazil, and she helped build a community of freed Africans, a maroon society. There, she loosened her braids and finally planted her mother's rice, where her descendants still grow it to this day. This daughter not only brought the seed to South America, but the knowledge of growing these crops organically in tropical soils, something her European enslavers couldn't possibly have known how to do. Now, there's another version of the story. It's told in Alabama. And it's the story of an African woman who wove okra seeds into her hair before leaving her own homeland. Okra was another plant that was unknown to Europe and to the Americas before Africans brought them here. There's a story, there's a version of this story that's told by American immigrants too. It's the story of people from Germany and Ireland and Italy. They arrived to America in the 1800s with seeds sewn into the hems of their skirts, seeds into the cuffs of their socks, sewn into their coat sleeves, 
Same story. Seeds hidden from customs and immigration agents who were fearing the contamination of the food supply. These immigrants brought seeds and knowledge of age-old growing techniques that have shaped the way we grow and eat today. I know there's probably a version of the story, the same seed story, told of the Abenaki on whose land we stand, but I don't know it. I'm sure somebody does. In fact, I bet uh, Dr. Fred Wiseman does. I don't know if he's here. If he is, please come see me after this. He's been working on the Seeds of Renewal project, which uh, is reviving heritage Abenaki crops and techniques in this area. So these stories can really unite us, and if we dig deeper, they will connect us to the traditional practices of our ancestors, practices that are reverent to the land. And these stories are the rich, intricate, fibrous roots of organic agriculture. There is another thing that these stories have in common that I just mentioned. They are, each of them, stories of people who were oppressed, right? Enslaved peoples, colonized peoples, people forcibly removed from their land, people fleeing hunger, poverty, fascism. Our stories force us to recognize a hard truth. Hard for us that love farming and feeding ourselves and each other. And that truth is that there is nothing inherently virtuous about farming. Despite its importance and its beauty and its centrality to our society, there is nothing inherently virtuous about it. Often the very root of oppression is farming itself. My ancestors were enslaved to further agriculture in this country. Native peoples were forcibly removed from their lands to clear way for agriculture in this country. Peasants in Europe, in Asia, and South America, the world over, have been subjugated by colonial, col eh? colonialism, imperialism, capitalism, for centuries, all in service of agriculture. And this might be controversial, but if we are honest, even the act of farming itself is a form of subjugation. We impose our will on the land and on countless organisms the soil sustain. So no matter how carefully and mindfully and naturally, farming will always in some sense be a sense of intrusion to the natural order in some way. That's why I feel we must recognize the very real ways that farming has been used as a tool of oppression in the past so we don't replicate them in the present. Just as sharing and learning about each other's agrarian roots can help us connect with others, so can tapping into our own historic and current traumas and pain around land and agriculture. I'm not saying that all pain is equal or all oppression is the same, it's not. But perhaps if we remember our forebearers, our own forebearers suffered unjustly under the yoke of agriculture, we can better recognize how our current food system is still used as a tool of oppression in so many ways against people of color, against people with disabilities, against immigrants and women and farm workers. Perhaps sharing our stories can help us join together to dismantle the system and build something better and more just in its place. This is the work at Farm School NYC, the organization I feel so blessed to steward. I have been speaking so much, and farm school means so much to me. I'd actually much rather you hear more about it from people other than myself, from the community that we built up around the school. So I'm actually gonna pause here for a moment and show a brief video about Farm School NYC. Then we'll come back together and talk a little bit more about how stories are so central to the work that we do there. So thank you. Thank you, Zach. My name is Onika Abraham. I'm the director of Farm School NYC. Farm School NYC is a comprehensive professional training program for adults who are learning sustainable agriculture within the context of food justice and community building here in New York City. We're here today at Takwa Community Farm to talk with Farm School NYC current and past students. Really have a conversation about urban farming, education, and people's connections to community. I think from my point of view, the biggest misconception about urban farming is that it's new. Like it's this new thing that just happened in, in hipster Williamsburg or something. Like 
urban farming is as old as cities are. Then there's the other extreme, and people think that, you know, we're just in abandoned lots. Urban ag fits in every circumstance differently. Mm -hmm. And so you look at what people are doing in Atlanta versus Houston versus Detroit, and like, it takes on a different, you know, depending on kind of what the space available is and what the needs of the community are. And I think another simple misconception is that it's impossible. Like, what, you farm in the Bronx? Like, yeah, there's, it's a thing that happens. In addition to feeding people, there's also kind of that social gathering and that community aspect that I think brings people together. And it's not just about growing food. It's part of a bigger picture. To me, the urban farming is very, very important. It's a place where people from the city can learn how to grow their own food. But it's also a place where we can talk to each other. When I think of food sovereignty, I think of uh, people and communities having a direct say in where is the seed coming from? Who grew it? Is it a hybrid? Is it organic? We have so many little buzzwords and sound bites and catchphrases floating around. And this term organic, like just look that up in the dictionary. There's a real definition and it means things that are living and then really understand what that means in your relationship to it. Like does a farm need to have an organic certification on it for you to be okay with it? What does that certification even mean? How much does it cost? Most people who come to farm school are looking to build an alternate way of life, a way of interconnecting with each other. We're not looking for independence in a sense. We're really trying to find ways to connect with each other to build an alternative system to what is out there. I'm always like amazed at like how people from different cohorts and classes are like totally in touch and know each other. And I'm like, I'm glad that's happening. <laughs> but you know, in a way I'm also like, how do we keep that happening? I had nothing to do with editing that. <laughs> Thank you. So you heard from the voices of our students and alums, really, that farming and community can be a tool for liberation and self-determination. We really believe that. Um, and I believe we share that belief with many people in this room, homesteaders especially. You know, We are determining our own food systems. As an educator, I really also know that there's no choice no real chance for true liberation if you can't locate and celebrate your own experience in farming. Um, that's why I feel every farmer needs to know that organic agriculture not only holds their future, but that all peoples had a role in its past. And I think this is often obscure, obscured and hidden from us. We often hear that organic agriculture is based on traditional and, and indigenous practices. But as a person whose forebearers were traditional farmers, and indigenous people in Africa. I have to say that's not enough. It's not enough for us to lump together generations of people from across the globe into categories like traditional and indigenous as if there were not particular people who farmed in particular ways. Perhaps the most commonly known indigenous farming practice, I mean, what is the most commonly known indigenous farming practice in America? Please tell me. The Three Sisters, right? Everyone knows the Three Sisters. Three Sisters is intercropping corn and squash and beans to create a mutually beneficial growing environment and actually also a really nutritionally balanced crop harvest. But how often do we hear the names of actual communities that practice this? How often do we discuss, for example, the Seven Sisters that the Abenaki celebrated, which not only included those three, but tobacco and sunflowers and Jerusalem artichokes and ground cherries. Very specific people and very specific practices. Europeans may have codified the scientific method, but all of our ancestors examined, experimented, observed, hypothesized, assessed, tested, and shared agricultural practices from generation to generation. Everyone did. Explorers and writers in colonial era may not have really known or endeavored to find out exactly who developed certain practices. And what specificity they did capture may have been lost in efforts to really summarize and popularize these skills. But that doesn't mean that we should settle for these broad generalizations, or worse, for people's contributions to be just completely overlooked. As an educator in service of beginning farmers, I need to know the contributions of all peoples, if for no other reason, for recruitment. 92% of farms are operated by whites in America. And as we heard yesterday, and as we hear all the time, this number is decreasing. 
and the average age of farmers is increasing. An area for growth is farms that are operated by people of color. And one way to actually recruit more people of color is to start to heal this history of oppression in agriculture and to honor the contributions of their ancestors to this work in a real way. Thankfully, there are scholars and practitioners that are beginning to unearth and uplift this knowledge. So there's people like sociologist Joseph Fagan, who has studied the lasting impact of the Fulani people in West Africa in this country. The Fulani were cattlemen for centuries in, in uh, Africa before Europeans came to Africa. And as enslaved peoples in the American South, they brought artificial insemination for breeding into this, into this country, as well as patterns of open um, grazing. And that's native to their, uh, their native Senegal and Nigeria. And these practices are still in use today. Geographer Judith Carney, who's the woman I originally heard this story from that I told about the braids and the seeds of rice, she has been documenting and, uh, and exploring how African plants and knowledge revitalize the soils here in America. So historians have known for decades that pre-colonial Africans improved their own tropical soils with carefully diversified crop plans. Monoculture was really a colonial invention and a very destructive one, as you can imagine. Sugarcane in particular, sugarcane monocropping really de decimated soils in the Caribbean area. Instead of leaving land fallow, which was the most common practice in Europe at the time, enslaved Africans inter interplanted two native food crops, um, sorghum and pigeon peas, in the same field. The peas renewed soil fertility by fixing nitrogen, like all peas do. And the sorghum helped produce compaction and suppressed weeds. So intercropping, which is a vital organic agricultural technique, has African roots as well. We are rediscovering some of our cultural and spiritual agri agricultural practices as well. So there's a dynamite farmer that I know and a teacher at Farm School NYC who tells this story about a woman from his native Mississippi. She, it sounds weird. She always placed an okra seed in her mouth before she planted them out, always. And she would say that the seed needed to get to know her before it grew to nurture her. So she would keep this in her mouth. And, you know, there is actual science behind this practice, right? Has anyone ever soaked seeds before planting them out before? To break down the seed coat, right? To help the seeds emerge more readily? So the enzymes in our saliva might help do that even more rapidly. Um, and so in a hard Mississippi hot clay, that could be a real advantage to do something like that. So our cultural and spiritual practices around food and farming can be really powerful, even if they haven't been sanctioned by double-blind studies and scientific papers quite yet. At Farm School NYC, we really strive to include this knowledge in our lessons, in our practice, and in our lives. Uh, but we must find this knowledge first. We need to support the ethnobotanists, the researchers, the historians, and the folklorists who are uncovering these stories for us. And we need to do our own digging, starting with the stories of our own families and communities. At this point, I would love to have you guys speak again and talk about those stories that I'm sure some of the things that I just r r brought up, I brought up in you. So the stories of the Abenaki and the Fulani might have made you think about their, your own cultural practices, things that have been passed down to you, and you might wonder, I wonder you know, what the real significance of that is. What cultural roots these particular practices have? That's the work that we all need to do together and to share with each other. I really can't think of a better way to enhance the learning of the beginning farmers than to have them tap into their own stories and share that out. But we don't have time for that, writing it. No, okay. <laughs> Not today, anyway. <laughs> so I really think that our stories of connection keep us rooted in practices that are good for the land and for people and for communities. And our stories of oppression keep us vigilant about injustice and mindful of replicating those same actions and systems that have harmed us and others. I've only really just started to scratch the surface of my own ancestral knowledge. But it, reclaiming that history helps me reclaim the dignity and farming that my history often overwhelms. We all have hidden histories. We have to create space and reclaim what's been lost. 
If we hearken back to a history full of holes as the foundation of our organic movement, what chance do we have of really succeeding? The organic movement has the power for immense social change. I really believe that. Organic matters. But the truth is, organic matters so much more if you can see your own experience reflected there. And we all can, because we are all organic. Organic is us. It is literally the compilation of the land-based, nature-nurturing traditions we all have our roots in if we can just reach back far enough. So I urge you not to let others summarize it for you and to fight the impulse to simplify it. If we do, we lose the richness of our agrarian lives together. What we lose is the woman with the seeds of the future wrapped up in her own hair. Thank you so much for letting me come here today. Have a good day. Swag. Thank you. And the hat. Yeah, we're what? gonna leave you with some some Vermont swag. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I think this is your first time in Vermont, correct? Uh, it is my first time. So I've been close, but yeah. So Anika drove up from New York City with her husband and small son on Friday. Who I hope are here somewhere. And um, I, you know, given the some of the weather we've had and. She was saying how excited her husband is to drive to Vermont, and I was like, oh no. I'm sorry, we just, we just got a Jeep recently, and he's so excited about like challenging it in the snow. So this, he was so disappointed. He's like, Vermont, you've let us down. Sorry, otherwise. But I just want to thank Anika for making the trip and for sharing with us today, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you.